Well, grace and peace to you all this morning. Um, This is a hard passage that we get to look at today. Um, When we looked at it as a staff on Tuesday, some of the first responses I heard were, yikes, glad I'm not preaching this weekend. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Um, So I'm gonna do my best, and I feel like I came out with more questions than anything else. So if you bear with me through a lot of these questions, maybe we can wrestle with them together. And it would be easy to just skip over all those questions and just say, it's forgiveness, I can preach on forgiveness. But I felt like this passage was calling us to dig deeper. Um, Kind of broken into three parts. In the first part, there's kind of those instructions for how to, on calling out sin in our community, right? It was go to your brother if they sin and call them out. And then if that doesn't work, then Yeah, we've got instructions here. But the first thing that stuck out to me is that Jesus isn't saying what sins we should be calling out. He doesn't define that sin. And as we've been taught, there's not one sin that's greater than another. So how are we to pick and choose what sins we call out in others? There's some churches that take this how-to very seriously. It's biblical. This is how we should interact and call out each other. And I texted a friend as I was going through this and said, is it okay if I share your story of your fiance? And she said, as long as you strip it of personal information. So, um, so this is their story. And uh, this last year, they moved in together. They're not married yet. They're engaged. And he goes to a very conservative church and the week before they were to move in his friend called him up and said can we meet up he said sure and they went and had coffee and his friend said you know this is a sin you can't live with your girlfriend before you're married not even your fiance and he said well i appreciate your concern but we're signing the lease next week we're moving in and the friend didn't really like that response So then he went and called a couple of friends and said, can we meet up again? He said, sure. And again, his response was, still moving in with my girlfriend. And they still didn't like that response. So then they went to the church and they sat down with the pastor and said, you need to have a conversation with him because this is wrong. And when the fiance's answer still didn't change, He was then told he's welcome to be a member sitting in the congregation, but he was very nicely asked to give up his leadership roles within the church. See, for them, treating him as a pagan or a tax collector meant he was no longer welcome to be a leader in that church. Now, I agree that if a friend is sinning, and you should be able to call them out. You should be able to... In, that, in the midst of that relationship, to walk alongside of them and have that private conversation. But we're all sinners. So at which point do you then take it to calling on the friends, to calling on the church, calling on the pastor? Do we take every, every issue that we have before the church if we can't reach a resolution? How do we decide which of those issues to bring? If we know that the sin isn't about us, if we know that it's about that person's relationship with God, maybe we should look at how Jesus dealt with pagans and tax collectors. See, Jesus called them by name. He went and sat and broke bread with them. He built relationships. But he also didn't just invite them to come and say, hey, I'm giving a talk to these 5,000 and I'm gonna feed them. He called some of those tax collectors to be his closest disciples and friends. He gave them leadership roles within his ministry. So what is our response as the church when people that we are in relationship with are living in sin? How do we respond? How are we to live in this? I think it's interesting that this sets up the whole conversation for what's to come. Because the second part is where we go into Um, verses 19 and 20, where two or more are gathered in my name, there also I am. 
And there's something about being in agreement with others when we come before God. I was listening to some podcasts trying to get my head around all of this, and Joyce Meyer has a whole podcast, probably about an hour long, and she made this point. She said, we can't argue and fight with each other all week long, disagree, and then expect to come into church on Sunday morning, and then we can agree, and then we can come before God, and then it will be okay. It's about living a whole life in agreement. Then I started to think of what this could look like in our world. I didn't want to go for the surface stuff, so we're going to go a little deep today. And the thought that I had was of South Africa, Desmond Tutu, and Nelson Mandela. Now some context. Around 1945, the government of South Africa introduced the idea of apartheid. It was a social system that made segregation part of the law. And it came at a time when the rest of the world was starting to move away from racial policies and laws. Archbishop Desmond Tutu became an international advocate against apartheid in the 80s. He was an outspoken activist that was deeply committed to nonviolence resistance. And in 1994, after Nelson Mandela was elected as South Africa's first black president, he asked Desmond Tutu to investigate all the atrocities that were committed during apartheid on both sides. And they created a group called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now I had to give that backstory because what Joyce Meyer had said, I feel like Desmond Tutu kind of reiterated when he says in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, he talks about this restorative justice. And he says that none in our community could claim that we had not ourselves been deeply wounded by apartheid. We chose to walk the path of forgiveness and reconciliation, looking to the healing of relationships. See, forgiveness does not mean condoning what has been done. Forgiving means abandoning your right to pay back the perpetrator in his own coin. This was a community of people that had been hurt deeply but they agreed before God, not just on one day of the week, but it became a lifestyle culture for them. And I think that Tutu and Meyer are agreeing that it's the relationships of agreement, that it's a daily thing. Now, South Africa lived in apartheid for years, for decades, before things changed. And when I think about that aftermath of them having to move forward, I can't imagine that they met once and said, we forgive them, we move on. So it makes sense that it takes time. And as Kim reiterated, that Peter asked that question, how many times shall I forgive? It was a legitimate question. How many times do I need to forgive someone? And he throws out this number of seven. In Jewish culture, forgive three but not four times. So, you know, he's doubling it. Yeah, would be pretty good. I'm being pretty gracious. Can you imagine the shock then when Jesus says not seven, but 77, or 70 times seven? I've talked about the importance of numbers before. And the number seven symbolizes completeness. So when Jesus is telling Peter 70 times seven, he's saying, stop keeping track. Forgive completely and do it as many times as is necessary. Even when you think that you've given everything, push yourself, forgive them again. And so we hear all of this, all of this leads up to this telling of this parable. The third part of this passage, the story of the servant who owes his master, in essence, millions of dollars. It's about 15 years of wages. And he doesn't ask for forgiveness. That's not at all what the servant is asking for. He's begging for patience. And in that begging and just wanting patience, the master is overcome with mercy for the servant, and he absorbs that loss. He knows that there is absolutely no way that this servant could repay what had been taken. And so the master sets him free. 
But almost immediately after being granted freedom, the servant went to his peer who owed him the equivalent of a few hundred dollars. And instead of responding in the same way he had just been responded to, he holds on to that anger, to that greed, to the selfishness, to whatever that feeling is of why he feels he is owed that money. And he holds on to it. And he throws that peer into prison, leaving him with no hope for redemption, no hope for freedom. I'm going to pause that and tell you a story about Matthew West. He's one of my favorite singers in the Christian radio. A couple of years ago, he wrote a song called Forgiveness. It took him a few years to write it. But he wrote this whole album of songs from stories that had been sent to him. And the story of forgiveness was mother who wrote him to tell her story, that her daughter had been killed in a drunk driving accident. And in living, she found herself living out this story that she never would have chosen for herself, of traveling around the world talking to teenagers and young adults about the impacts of drunk driving. But she realized as she was going through that she, something was missing. She wasn't completely whole. She still had this bitterness. And as she prayed, she and her family went and sat with the young man that had killed their daughter. And they prayed with him, and they prayed for him. And as they spent this time in prayer with him and for him, they built a relationship. They came to love this young man, and they didn't want to see him wasting 22 years of his young life in prison. So they went to the judge and on his, on his behalf, this family fought for him to be early released. They cut his sentence in half. That's huge. But that's not something that was easy. Or something that happened overnight. On Wednesday night, if you come, we've got the prayer station set up around um, forgiveness. And one of the songs that we'll play is this song, Forgiveness. But here's some of these words. It's the hardest thing to give away. It's the last thing on your mind today. It always goes to those who don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they've caused you is just too real. And even when the jury and the judge say you've got a right to hold a grudge, it's the whisper in your ear saying to set it free. It'll clear the bitterness away, and it can even set a prisoner free. There's no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace, because the prisoner that it really frees is you. Well, in November of this past year, some of you may know, the community that I served before Pilgrim suffered an unimaginable loss. It was a Saturday morning before All Saints Sunday, and a local Girl Scout troop was on the side of a back highway doing roadside cleanup. When a young man and his friend decided to stop at a Walmart and get a can of aerosol spray and get high. They didn't want to wait until they got home. So on the drive home, they went down a back highway where they were huffing and they got high. When the driver started to lose control, the passenger tried to grab the wheel to keep them on the road, and the driver overcorrected, went into the ditch, swerved back out onto the road, and kept going. But when he went into that ditch, he hit five girls, four fourth graders and a parent. Three of them were, three of the young girls died immediately, and the mom died on the scene, and the fourth little girl was sent to the hospital with serious injuries. That moment, that one moment, rocked the small town of Chippewa Falls. It rocked towns across Wisconsin. It resonated with Girl Scout troops across the country because it could have been any, any small Girl Scout troop, it could have been any group that does highway cleanup. So one of those little girls, her name was Autumn, and Autumn was a fourth grader at my church. 
and her mom was one of the leaders in our youth program. I've gotten to talk with Kim a lot over the last few months and I've watched her on Facebook as she's dealt with this tragic loss. See, society and the judges and the juries all say that everybody has a right to hold this grudge. See, she lost her daughter, but she makes strides every day to work on forgiving, like she taught her daughter to do at church. The week after the accident, she posted a video, and I was going to try and play it, but I don't think it's going to work. It was her two little girls saying the Lord's Prayer. And the caption on the video was simply, forgive those who sin against you. The power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. It can't be easy, but we say those words every week before we come to communion. Now I remember the day she went for a jog where the accident had been, it was right by their house. And how determined she was that she could forgive him for that, but she wasn't going to let him take anything else in her life. So she was going to fight to be able to walk down that road again. That was the moment that I saw God's power and glory shining through her actions. Now I did say it was a community that was rocked. That Sunday afternoon, one of the girls that I would gotten to work with was a college student. And as soon as she found out, she called me. See, she'd been Autumn's Sunday school teacher, and she was so mad. She was just so overcome with anger, because as much as she loved Autumn, she also had a relationship with the young man. And she had seen his story. She'd known him since they were in elementary school. And how could this boy that she knew have, have um, not been able to handle his struggle with addiction, depression, his hurt over many of his friends who committed suicide through the years. And she didn't know how she could be part of that community that he was in and be part of the community that Autumn was in and how she could walk through that and forgive him. I don't know how to, I didn't know what to say. I was able to sit with her and just listen. Because how do you reconcile when somebody is no longer a villain in a story, but is a broken human being who is also fully loved by God? So just like this parent and this college student, this story is part of my story. And all of the people of Chippewa Falls, family members who are outside of that community, we've all been changed. And there's been countless people who've had to grieve through this. So is Jesus, what is he saying when there's a situation like this that's hard? Can it be forgiven? How do we pray for, the, for these villains that we see them, knowing that they're fully broken human beings just like us? Are there certain situations that are impossible to forgive? What if we can't? Will God understand or will it be held against us? See, when relationships are broken, the one wronged has power over the one who has wronged us. This young man, the young man with the woman who wrote the forgiveness song, all they can do is ask for forgiveness. They're powerless to heal the wounds. All they can do is open themselves and risk vulnerability and ask. But it's up to us who have been wronged to absorb a debt that is too great to be repaid. It's up to us, the ones who've been wronged, to realize that no matter what the debt is owed to us, the debt that we owe God for our own sins is greater. What I found in spending time with this parable this week is that everyone has a forgiveness story. Either you've been the one to forgive something great, or you've been forgiven for something great. And my guess is, what I've seen, 
is that there's lots of questions. So in the midst of my questions and wonderings, this is what I've found. Forgiveness and love are somehow inextricably linked. Forgiveness sounds simple, but it's complex and difficult. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it is a conscious choice that you have to commit to daily. You don't have to like it, in fact, you probably won't. There is no fake it till you make it, you have to just do it. You have to be vulnerable. You have to know what it is that, and that it's not a shortcut to healing. It takes strength to forgive. We can let the pain and scars remind us that we're broken, or we can let it remind us that we need to forgive. Forgiveness means giving up the power that you hold over someone else. Forgiveness breaks the connections between you and the one who has hurt you. And forgive, as Kim pointed out today, forgiveness is for all of us, and it leaves no marks, just like an eraser. So I leave you with this. Today is one single day in your big life, and this little bit has been 15 minutes on a Sunday morning. What will you take with you? What questions do you have? As I've been talking, what situation has come to mind that you need to forgive or that you need to be forgiven? What's next for you? <laughs>